thank you. Thanks very much for attending uh, my presentation today. Um, I have a, sli a slightly shorter uh, amount of time because of the uh, previous delays, I guess. But I'll try to present my work in an interesting way as the best as I can. So we'll be talking about something that is really important for uh, not only researchers, and I come from a more research uh, setting, but also for clinical psychologists and other uh, related mental health uh, professionals, because uh, assessment is uh, one of the key aspects of our work, uh, because when we diagnose someone or with some kind of um, psychopathology, we want to be sure that we are doing it in the best way possible. So this is a brief introduction to, to what I will be talking today related to internet gaming disorder. So a uh, brief overview about what I have been done, uh, what I will be talking today uh, is about a previous conceptual framework on defining internet gaming disorder, how we in research understood uh, gaming addiction previous to, previously to the uh, latest advancements in the field. I will also be talking about current debates and limitations surrounding the assessments, surrounding the assessments uh, of internet gaming disorder. And finally, we'll be discussing, uh, I will be discussing how we uh, do the assessment of internet gaming disorder in the present days uh, in light of the latest findings. So it's going to be difficult to be original because uh, my colleagues uh, Mark Griffiths and Darius just presented perhaps a third of what I'm going to talk today. So this is, is good because then I can speed up things a bit. Before we go into the uh, some uh, before we go into the details of uh, assessment of internet gaming disorder, I would like to introduce you to some essential facts uh, about gaming behavior itself. And uh, to do this, I will present you some of the latest data on uh, game playing habits that was uh, part of a big study conducted in the US that in included more than 4,000 uh, households in that country. And so this relates to a big national representative sample. Uh, and according to these reports, nearly 50% of the American population play video games actively. And they devote usually three or more uh, hours per week to video games. And as you can see here, 51% of the US households own a dedicated game console. And they it's easily uh, understandable that gaming, game playing is a very common behavior in Western countries and Eastern countries as well. Interestingly, and perhaps shocking to some of you, uh, the average game player is 35 years old, so it kind of contradicts our stereotype of a male teenager uh, in his room playing excessively, so we now so we, we, s we know that the, ga the average game player is not, not a male teenager, so it's older than that. And 56% of the US gaming population is male. So there is a relatively gender, gender um, equilibrium here. And game players aged between 36 to 49 years and above 50 years, they represent almost half of the entire uh, gamers population in the US, which is quite interesting, quite interesting if we think about it. And the most frequently female game player is on average 43 years old, while the average male game player is 35 years old. So these are not the uh, numbers we are thinking about, I guess, when we think about gaming. Just some numbers here on uh, which median players prefer to play video games. And we have here com desktop computers as the most preferred uh, uh, median for playing video games followed by uh, dedicated game consoles. And interestingly, uh, these gamers have been playing video games for about 13 years. So they start started, uh, they usually start at an early age. In terms of conceptualizing addictive gaming behavior, um, I would like to start saying that uh, most of the research that has been done so far relies on a broad range of um, definitions and conceptual frameworks for defining uh, what we call game, uh, gaming addiction. And behavior addictions have typically been categorized, uh, including gaming addiction, uh, within the frameworks of impulse control disorder or substance use disorders. And empirical studies conducted before the, DS, the publication of the DSM-5 on gaming based their definitions either on the criteria of pathological gambling or substance use disorders, as you may expect. 
I would like to present you some of the uh, first studies, first empirical studies on gaming addiction. And as you can see here, uh, there, there are some reports that dates back to the 80s on gaming addiction. And interestingly, uh, there is a very cited st uh, study that's cited very often uh, on a case study that was presented presented by Soper and Millen in 1983 about a case of gaming addiction. And interesting here to see is that he refers to gaming um, as an addiction, addiction that proved similar to other addictions. So um, he's talking about co compulsive behavior involvement with games, lack of interest in other activities, association mainly with other addicts. And this is also stresses the uh, potential social uh, aspects of games. And then the authors go on saying that in this particular instance, a gaming addiction uh, resulted in failing grades due to dimini diminished school activity. And he also mentions uh, some of the um, physical aspects or withdrawal related symptoms to gaming like the shakes. And he also explains how gaming addiction in this case resulted in several impairments for that person, including skipping classes, inability to avoid play when encountering new machines, and also some financial losses that back then because most of the gaming was being done on arcades. Okay. Uh, another key study that I would like, an early key study that I would like to show you uh, or to talk about is the study that was done by Egli, Egli and Meyers in 80, 1984. And yes. And this study is interesting here because it was the first study to develop an, an instrument to assess gaming addiction. Uh, and it I included a relatively large sample for that time, so 151 participants. And the authors tried to see uh, how gaming addiction was impacting on their sample. And they found that uh, about 13% of the sample displayed compulsive video game playing behavior. And in that study, gaming addiction or computer addiction was termed, uh, sorry, uh, in that study, gaming addiction was seen more like a, a compulsive disorder. So similar to pathological gambling later on. In terms of the uh, uh, typologies that have been presented so far, one of the most cited typologies is the one that has been discussed before by, by Dariakas and also Mark Griffiths, and it's the typology that was presented by Kimberly Young. And on Kimberly Young's first papers, she noted that internet addiction was very similar to pathological gambling, and this had some consequences to research, even to current research. And one of the, I usually criticize this model very much, or this conceptual framework, as you will see, because here the term internet addiction includes several specific addictions. And, and we will see later that gaming addiction not only occurs on the internet, but also offline. So there is an implication for categorizing everything under the umbrella term of internet addiction. Moreover, research, recent research has shown now that internet addiction in one hand is different from gaming addiction on the other hand. Okay. Another consequence of uh, Young's typology of internet addiction, which includes uh, gaming addiction as a type of internet addiction, is that if we look at the uh, latest studies on on internet addiction, uh, sorry, on gaming addiction, most of them have used instruments that assess internet addiction instead, which is quite confusing, right? Um, this might generate problem in research because obviously both behaviors are not the same, even though they may share some simi uh, similarities. And we will see this further. In terms of uh, conceptual models, I would like to present you the cognitive behavioral model of in pathological internet use. And this model is very influential. It was developed by, by Daves in early 2000s. And it tries, tries to explain uh, the etiology uh, and consequences of specific internet e uh, pathological internet use and generalized pathological internet use. In the case of gaming addiction, we are more interested in learning more about specific pathological internet use. So according to this model, internet use um, uh, is usually described as the set of uh, symptoms, uh, as a set of symptoms, and it has uh, specific variables that account for 
for its origin uh, in people. And one of the novel things about this model is that it was the first one to distinguish uh, between specific in internet addiction and generalized internet addiction, so to speak. In according to this model, Davis defined a specific pathological internet use uh, broadly. He said that it was could be broadly defined as a type of internet addiction where people are dependent on a specific function of the internet, such as gaming, whereas general generalized pathological internet use relates more to a general multidimensional overuse of the internet, and which in turn is related to the use of many different online applications without any specific purpose. In this model, uh, symptoms of pathological internet use primarily derive from maladaptive cognitions, and which in turn relates to cognitive symptoms, and as such may include obsessive thoughts about the internet, diminished impulse control, inability to seize internet use, as well as a generalized feeling that internet is the only place where individuals feel good about themselves. So we can see that this conceptual framework still relies very much on the idea of impulsive control disorder, which is also relevant for pathological gambling. Other, other pathological internet, uh, internet use symptoms include thinking about the internet and other important cognitive distortions as well. Um, another extension of this model was proposed by Brands and in a paper that was recently published. And these authors basically tried to expand Dave's model using some more neu neurobiological findings. And what these authors did was try to take into account import important neuropsychological neuropsycho mechanisms, control processes that are mediated by executive fun functions and prefrontal cortical areas to explaining uh, the or origin or etiology of internet addiction. Uh, these authors uh, model attempts to explain and understand the development and maintenance of both types of internet addiction. Uh, I'm not going into too many details on, on, these f on these figures, but the authors then try to explain how functional internet use occurs, and also how generalized internet addiction and specific internet addiction occurs. I would just focus more on specific internet addiction. So according to this neurobiological model, uh, Brand argued that while functional internet use encompasses the use of the internet as a tool for dealing with personal needs, uh, he also argues that um, both generalized internet addiction and specific internet addiction serve different uh, purposes in the context of addiction. And these authors also noted that psychopathology is involved in both uh, in the development of specific internet uh, addiction, and this is relevant for gaming ad addiction research because we have to take into account previous psychopathology, just like Dave's model as well. Other variables that are important in this model relates to expectancy. Um, and this author says that expectancy that such internet applications can satisfy certain desires increases the likelihood of frequent use and the individual begins to lose control over the use. Gratification is also important here because uh, it is experience and the use of such applications and also the specific internet use expectancy, ex expectancies and the coping style are reinforced positively. Uh, another assumption of this model is that the more general psychopathology, uh, psychopathology, such as depression, social anxiety, are negatively reinforced due to the fact that additional specific internet applications can be used to distract from problems in real life. Uh, this is perhaps, perhaps the model that I know the, b uh, the best, and I have been working uh, with this model in developing my tools for assessing gaming addiction. And the components model of addiction was developed by Professor Mark Griffiths. And it, the idea behind this model is that all addictions consist of a number of distinct compon components, such as salience, mood modification, tolerance, withdrawal, conflict, and relapse. And that addictions are part of a complex biopsychosocial process. So we cannot understand and define addiction without taking into account biological, psychological, and social aspects. This model is often used uh, to support the concept of technological addictions, which are defined as non-chemical behavioral addictions that involve excessive and problematic human-machine interaction. 
In this context, technological addictions can be regarded as a subset of behavior addiction. So all these ideas are related here, and ultimately they are defined by the presence or absence of, uh, in this case, the presence of these six important components. Uh, Mark also elaborates on the idea that technological addictions can be either passive or, or active and usually contain dishing and reinforcing features which may contribute to the promotion of addictive tendencies. In turn, uh, in turn addictive behaviors are oper operationally defined as any behavior featuring all six core components of addiction. And according to this conceptual framework, any behavior including game, game playing that that features all six uh, addiction criteria would be then classed as an addiction. Uh, just as a curiosity, uh, in one of our papers, uh, I try we try to highlight the similarities between the components model of addiction and the more updated definition of gaming addiction based on the DSM-5-9 criteria. And we can see here that there's pretty much a huge overlap between the six components and the nine criteria of uh, internet gaming disorder, which I'll explain briefly to you. So to summarize these uh, initial conceptual frameworks, I would like to say that um, these models, they helped promote research in the fields. And but there are some disadvantages in turn. And gaming addiction was framed by most conceptual frameworks under the umbrella term internet addiction, which is highly, highly problematic both methodologically and conceptually. And most of these models, uh, they give the idea that ga uh, gaming addiction only occurs on the internet, which, not the, which is not the case. Um, so that's one of the, cri uh, the criticisms I personally have against these models. Uh, so how was researchers and clinicians assessing gaming addiction before the publication of the DSM-5. So this is the next uh, part of the presentation. And we have seen that researchers often relied on diverse and heterogeneous conceptual frameworks to understand and, uh, and develop their own instruments for assessing gaming addiction. And this resulted in diagnosis and conceptual confusion, leading some researchers to call for a more commonly agreed criteria in which both validity and reliability can be better uh, ascertained across studies. Uh, there were a couple of sy systematic reviews on the issue, and they tried to, to, uh, to, to see how assessment was being done. And for example, the research done, the review conducted by King and colleagues King and colleagues reviewed a total of 63 empirical studies, including 18 different instruments. And the authors then concluded that these instruments could broadly be characterized as inconsistent, since no two measures were alike in their conceptualization and the ability to map out diagnostic features. So you can see there is a huge inconsistency here. Uh, the authors then noted that some of the key limitations included inconsistent coverage of core addiction indicators, varying cutoff scores to indicate clinical status, lack of temporal dimension, uh, which in contrast now we have a 12 month window period for the latest criteria for gaming addiction. They also noted that uh, most instruments had untested or inconsistent dimensionality uh, or latent factors, and they also noted that most of the instruments presented with in inadequate or data or predictive validity and inter-rated reliability. However, there were some positive aspects, such as short lengths and ease of scoring of these instruments, excellent internal consistency and convergent validity, and potentially adequate data for development of standardized norms for adolescent populations. In a different analysis conducted by one of my colleagues and friends, uh, Kirai, and they reviewed 12 psychometric measures on gaming addiction, and they concluded that no, nothing new here, that a relatively large amount of studies on gaming addiction measured the construct with psychometric tools for generalized internet addiction, or the criterion of time spent on game, online gaming, and this is highly problematic, especially for using time spent on video games as a criterion, suf sufficient criteria for diagnosis uh, gaming addiction, because we know that time per se does do, do not translate addiction. And this is the table that I that resulted from one of our studies uh, on, on, the, on where we did a review on the instruments, and this includes 
nine assessment tools for internet gaming addiction. And this is basically an extension of the two previous literature review. And we can see here that there is a huge number of studies and criteria being used to assess what's apparently the same behavior. So some of the challenges and controversies. Uh, these reviews allows us to conclude that assessing game, gaming addiction with generalized internet addiction measures or other non-standardized tools has become common practice, especially in neuro, neuroimaging studies. However, this method may underestimate uh, this method of using generalized internet addiction tools to assess gaming addiction underestimates, underestimates the number of addicted gamers because for some of them, gaming may not be perceived as an internet activity, but rather a specific and separate activity. Therefore, for these gamers, the content may be more relevant and important than the medium itself. So how do we do assessment of internet gaming disorder or gaming addiction in the, time, in the era, era of the DSM-5? Okay. So as you may know, uh, the, the latest DSM-5 suggested game, internet gaming disorder as a tentative disorder. And they do note that uh, although they have preliminary included uh, internet gaming disorder, the only behavioral addiction that is formally recognized by the American Psychiatric Association is gambling disorder, which is now seen as a behavioral addiction per se. So moving on. Um, so to reach this conclusion about the internet gaming disorder, the APA conducted, commissioned a group to study it, and they reviewed more than 240 articles and found some behavioral similarities of internet gaming to gambling disorder and substance use disorders. So it seems that we didn't move that much from previous conceptualizations. And they also noted that the criteria for internet gaming disorder was largely derived from a Chinese study conducted by Tao and colleagues. And so internet gaming disorder appears on section three of the DSM-5, and it is an area that needs further research. And the definition they suggested for internet gaming disorder is basically this one here. So they are talking about persistence and recurrent use of internet games, often with other players, leading to clinically significant impairments or distress as indicated by five out of these nine criteria. I actually removed the word uh, uh, internet here deliberately because as I just said, gaming addiction can also occur offline. Uh, so I would say that a more correct term it would be gaming disorder instead of internet gaming disorder because this leads to confusion. So when you're talking about internet gaming disorder here in this context, uh, we're talking about preoccupation with games. So uh, for these people, gaming has become their most uh, dominant activity. We're also talking about withdrawal symptoms. Uh, when, when gaming is taken away, we're talking about tolerance. So they need to spend more time and to be more involved in games to achieve initial levels of pleasures and satisfaction. We're talking about difficulty in, in controlling the behavior, loss of interest in previous hobbies, continued excessive use even though they know that this behavior is causing them problems. Uh, we're also talking about deceiving family members, therapists or others regarding the amount of, of gaming. And we also talk about here uh, about use of games to escape or relieve negative moods, such as feelings of helplessness, guilty and, and anxiety and also risking significant relationship, jobs, uh, and educational opportunities that the individual may encounter. So uh, given the heterogeneity of instruments designed for assessing gaming addiction and some of the criticisms that were made to them, experts in the fields have now called for unification in the assessment of gaming addiction soon after the publication of the DSM-5. And this call for unification partly results from the need to increase validity and reliability across gaming addiction study, uh, and also advocates adequate and effic efficacy uh, treatment for the condition and move forward the fields. So based on the publication of the nine IGD criteria by the American Psychiatric Association in the DSM-5, and also the call for unification in the assessment of gaming addiction, Researchers are now working towards this objective and a number of new psychometric tools aimed uh, to assess internet gaming behavior using the latest conceptual framework suggested by the APA uh, started to emerge. So 
Uh, this is something completely new uh, that hasn't been uh, presented before, luckily. Um, and it summarizes the psychometric tools and uh, assessment interviews that we currently have that uh, were based on the IGD-9 criteria. And as we can see here, uh, we have um, just one clinical assessment tool, which is, which is the CVAT-20. Uh, and this instrument is uh, administered by the, uh, is the only one to be administered by the psychologist or by the psychiatrists. So it's different uh, from the other ones. And most of the other instruments are psychometric tests, very brief, uh, ranging from 29 from, from 27 items. And they usually have a time, time frame of 12 months, just as the DSM-5 definition. And they have a, a different, um, addiction criteria here as well. Uh, usually, okay, they usually say that addiction occurs if the person endorses five or more of the criteria being pres present. And only one of these instruments has been actually clinically validated, which is the clinical assessment tool. So as you can see here, there is lots of work that still needs to be done in the fields. Uh, and clinical validation here is key because if we don't use clinical samples to test how these instruments are doing, then there's not much we can conclude about them, right? Otherwise, we'll be just relying on statistics. And interesting here, only two instruments have been tested cross-culturally, so there's still lots of work to be done cross-culturally, and perhaps colleagues here in Turkey would be interested in validating one of these tests here as well. So yeah, some of the challenges and controversies uh, in the assessment of gaming addiction. Uh, I would like to note that although we have seen efforts to standardize and unify the assessment of IGD, the recent proliferation of such tools denotes a clear lack of consensus on the method used to assess uh, internet gaming disorder, So, which is kind of the opposite direction, right? And notwithstanding with this, the majority of these new tools appear to rely heavily on the conceptual framework set by the APA, which is a positive aspect of research in this field since these will likely produce robust evidence in favor or against this new gaming addiction framework developed by the APA. Future research could do lots of things uh, to help the field progress, and I would like to mention the lack of cross-cultural research on IGD, uh, we do need more cross-cultural research, clinical validation of existing tools, longitudinal studies, and this will be a good way to, to understand the etiology and the clinical course of the phenomenon because we don't know how IGD uh, really occurs in people. We just know, okay, there is a problem, but what is the de development? How does this problem develop? And sometimes people just in terms of remission, they just, the behavior, behavior disappears sometimes and we are not entirely sure how this happened. So, uh, yeah, I think this is pretty much it. I will leave plenty of space for discussion and I would like to, to thank the Turkish Green Crescent Society and the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology for supporting me in this presentation. And yeah. Some of th all the references I have used are here, um, and I can send you the presentation if you want. Yeah, I guess this is it. Thank you.